Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Caitlin and I upload a whole bunch of different types of videos on this channel, mainly surrounding true crime and psychological cases as well as a little bit of fashion and lifestyle sprinkled in where I can. Now today I'm back discussing a serial killer case which I haven't done for a little while simply because they typically will take a little bit more time to research and I often find that with serial killers there can be a lot of information out there that is maybe exaggerated or glamorized in some sense so sometimes it can be quite hard to pinpoint the facts that are the facts and not exaggerated in some way so hopefully i've done that uh, successfully today so today we're going to be discussing the serial killer named jerry brudos who i personally before researching this case i haven't really heard too much about i was aware of his existence but i hadn't really heard loads of information about his crimes i've actually recently just gone back to season one and binge watched all of mind hunter if any of you are watching that it is brilliant and jerry brudos was one of the serial killers that they featured in that show so i thought it'd be interesting to discuss the facts with you guys today so if you want to hear a little bit about the case of jerry brudos the serial killer then keep on watching but before we get started i'm just going to whiz through my usual disclaimer that i like to include in the start of all my videos i am in no means claiming to be an expert in this case nor any of the other cases that i cover over on my channel i'm simply relaying the information i'm able to find myself through research on the internet and because only certain sources are accessible to me it means that i may mispronounce things get things wrong or leave things out and i apologize if i do any of those things i'm not trying to cause any harm or any justice to anyone i'm simply working with the information that i have available to me so with all that being said we shall just go ahead and get started discussing jerry brudos the serial killer jerome henry brudos was born on january the 31st in the year of 1939 in a place called webster in south dakota from an early point in his life jerry experienced a lot of neglect and rejection at the hands of his mother who really really rejected him after she wanted to give birth to a baby girl his mother to my knowledge wasn't ever really really physically abusive towards Jerry, however she didn't exactly pay him a lot of love or attention and if she did it was particularly negative and demeaning in nature. When Jerry was five years old he came across a pair of discarded high heel shoes and he found himself immediately completely fascinated by them. He took them home and hid them in his room and when he was alone he would try them on and walk around his bedroom. But one day his mother discovered him wearing these shoes and told him that it wasn't appropriate for a young boy to be wearing them and so she took them off him and destroyed them and this was one of the first known sources of his fascination with women's shoes one which would later coin him one of his most infamous nicknames the shoe fetish slayer the psychological abuse he suffered meant that he spent a lot of his childhood in therapy and in hospitals and then when he entered his early teens he began his life of stalking and attacking women first his attacks would be on random women in the local town while he was out and about and he'd spotted them he would stalk them and once they were in isolation he would knock them out or choke them until they became unconscious before he would take off with their shoes and then when he was 17 years old his fantasies escalated when Brudos was just 17 years old, he was found having attacked a teenage girl. He'd held her at knife point and forced her to strip naked in front of him, after which he proceeded to take photos of her. There is a conflicting set of sources regarding the details of this set of attacks, as some sources say that it was just one victim who he also beat, while others say that he didn't beat this girl, but he went on to attack another woman who he then beat. Either way, when the attack or attacks were reported, he was sentenced to receive a treatment in a psychiatric hospital in in Oregon every day after school. He was then placed in a psychiatric ward for nine months after he was found to have dug a large hole and held girls hostage there as his sex slaves allegedly. He is known to have held a young girl at knife point, forced her to remove her clothes and let him photograph her naked. But as I say, following this there are a lot of conflicting sources so I apologise if any of that is incorrect. His therapy then led to the discovery of his dark, really dark sexual fantasies being based around his hate for his mother because of the neglect that he'd faced in early life and this was then projected onto all women. Following his release from the psychiatric ward, Jerry finished high school with no problems whatsoever, no attacks, nothing relating to his fantasies. It was almost as though he was able to suppress them entirely. And then after he'd graduated high school, he was employed working as an electronic technician. And then when Jerry turned 20, 
22 years old, he married a young woman and him and his new wife moved into a house together in Portland, Oregon. In the early years of their marriage, they had two children together, meaning that he was leading a seemingly normal nuclear family lifestyle. In retrospect, it is known that around this time he would constantly complain of these really excruciating migraines and headaches, as well as having episodes of blackouts. And it's now known that during these blackout episodes, he was prone to break into houses in the local neighborhood and steal women's shoes and underwear. Some sources say that in the year of 1967, Brudos carried out another attack. It's believed that he'd spotted a woman while he was out and about, noticed her shoes, and his fascination led him to follow her home. He'd waited until she'd slept, and then this is when he broke into her house and strangled her until she became unconscious. Here, he sexually assaulted her, stole some of her shoes, and left her house. It took authorities quite a long time to realise later on that this attack was related to Brudos and carried out by Brudos, as it wasn't until much later that they established this understanding of his fascination with women's shoes. The first of Jerry's known and named victims was a woman named Linda Slauson. Linda Catherine Slauson was born on January the 7th in 1949 in a place called Olmsted County in Minnesota, meaning that this poor woman lost her life at just 19 years old. Linda was part of a large family. She had five siblings. Their names were Richard, Diane, David, Barbara and Teresa, as well as her parents, Mildred and Wilbur, and a number of extended relatives. At the time Linda lost her life, she was living in Oregon with her mum, two of her sisters and one of her brothers. In January of 1968, Linda Slauson knocked on Jerry Brudos' door as she was working as a mobile encyclopedia saleswoman. He'd invited her into his home, giving her the impression that he wanted to buy some of her some of her products, which was obviously very typical in her day-to-day -day life when she was working, and the pair chatted about the books that she was selling as they walked through the house towards the basement. He had told her that he had two children and that his children would have loved the encyclopedias and that his mother and his daughter were actually upstairs playing, and so this is why he was taking her down to the basement where they could kind of discuss the sale and business without being disturbed. Brudos placed a stool down for her to sit on and once she did, he hit her over the head with a wooden plank, knocking her unconscious. He then used his own hands to strangle her until she was no longer breathing. After she died, he'd held her body in his house for quite a while, using her to dress her up in a number of women's clothing and underwear. His mother and daughter had in fact been upstairs at the time of the attack, but he'd wanted to get them out of the house so he could stay in the basement with Linda's remains, so he'd asked them to go out and pick up some burgers for the family dinner that night. Once they'd left the house entirely unaware of what he would be doing down in the basement, he began to undress the remains. He redressed her over and over again a number of times in different women's clothing and pieces of underwear that he'd been stealing from other women since he was young. He'd also removed one of her feet so that he could use it to put high-heeled shoes on that he'd also been collecting, and this trophy was kept in a freezer of his so that it could remain in his possession. According to Brudos, he'd thrown her body off of the Wilsonville Bridge down into Willamette River. He claims that as he was transporting the body into the boot of his car, he tied a heavy car part to the remains so that it would sink quickly once it was disposed. He'd also wanted to make sure that when he'd parked on the bridge ready to throw the body off into the river, that no one driving past would be suspicious of what he was doing. And so once he parked his car, he carefully placed his tyre changing kit, so any tools that he'd had or one would need to change a tyre, he carefully placed it in plain sight so that anyone driving past wouldn't really think it was anything strange as they'd just see these tools as though someone had pulled over because they'd blown their tyre. There was much uncertainty regarding Linda's death due to the fact that her remains were never recovered, but confirmation of Brudos' involvement in the murder came when he had admitted to investigators of having carried out the attack and then disposing of her remains. But I'll go into a little more detail into that later point. In November of that same year, Brudos had been out driving when he'd spotted a woman whose car had broken down on the side of the road. This woman had been Jan Susan Whitney, who had been heading home to spend Thanksgiving with her family. He'd pulled over, initially giving the impression that he wanted to offer her some help, but he proceeded to strangle her once she was inside his car. He sexually assaulted her body, and then he transported her to the workshop that he had inside his home. Here, he dressed her up in all these different women's clothing and posed her body to take photographs, and this time he removed one of her breasts to keep. No one had initially collected the two women's disappearances, likely due to the complete difference in scenarios relating to the pair of them disappearing. Linda Slauson worked as a door-to-door -door saleswoman, meaning that there is 
almost a likely risk not that it's common but it wouldn't be unlikely for someone if she'd knocked on the wrong person's door to attack her or abduct her or anything whereas jan whitney seemed to just disappear out of thin air after she'd left a friend's house on her drive home so it just didn't seem like the two were connected initially the next attack took place the following year on March the 27th when he abducted a 19 year old woman named Karen Sprinker. Karen was studying full time at the nearby Oregon State University and she'd made plans that day to meet her mother off campus for some lunch. The pair were going to eat and then head to the nearby department store after they'd had their meal so that they could spend some time together and buy some supplies and clothes that Karen needed for her new semester at university. However, before she'd even made it to her date with her mother, Brudos had spotted her in a parking garage in the department store in Salem in full daylight. At first, Karen's mother was initially concerned when her daughter didn't show up, although I think she simply put it down to, oh, she could have overslept or she could have forgotten anything. You kind of come up with all of these reasons and typical explanations. But once she'd searched her home and looked in all of the routes that she could have potentially taken to see maybe if there was any traffic, she virtually immediately reported her as a missing person because she knew something was wrong. After abducting Karen, Brudos had taken her back to his home where he'd sexually assaulted and strangled her. And after she died, he'd removed both of her breasts. The investigators carrying out the search for Karen Sprinker had eventually discovered her car parked in the department store parking garage, but no sign of Karen. But her books and all of her belongings were still piled neatly inside the car and there was no sign of a break-in or attack. Interestingly enough, I have written here, there was a report that had been placed a couple weeks before Karen had disappeared in the same parking garage that had come from two young girls who had been inside the parking garage and spotted this uh, this sighting and thought it was relevant to report to the police. But according to these two young girls, they'd spotted someone they described as being tall and heavy in stature and dressed in heels and a dress. The girl said this person had just been standing in the parking garage like nervously pulling at her clothes as though waiting for someone and they believed it had been a man in woman's clothing. They had for some reason, I don't know why, I couldn't find any more details, but they for some reason been concerned by this sighting and felt the need to report it to the police. And investigators did look into this report amid speculation that perhaps this person had been involved in Karen's abduction in some way, but it led to nowhere and could have been simply put down to a much more normal explanation that maybe it wasn't a typical day-to-day -day sight back then but nowadays you wouldn't typically call the police on a man that was wearing women's clothing and then four weeks later he would attack his next victim this time it was linda saley a 22 year old woman he'd spotted in a shopping center linda was on her way to meet her boyfriend but didn't show up to which he'd assumed that perhaps she'd made other plans or forgotten about their meeting but when she didn't turn up for work the following morning people began to get concerns the search for linda led to the discovery of her car inside the parking garage and suspicions were immediately raised when they discovered many of the details of the disappearance matched that of the recent disappearance of Karen Sprinker. Brudos had in fact abducted her, taken her back to his home and did exactly what he had done on his previous victims to this poor young woman. He disposed of her body in a nearby river and this later led to the discovery of the remains by a passerby. Brudos had initially weighed down her body using a spare car part and a nylon rope to tie them together. A man had been fishing on the Big Tom River and he'd noticed Linda Saley's body floating in the water. Police decided that they would continue to search the very same river for any other pieces of evidence and see if there was any other indication of what had happened to this woman, maybe other victims, and this is when they happened to come across the remains of Karen Sprinker. One thing that had been noted in regards to the way that the bodies had been disposed of and discovered was that both of them had been weighed down using the same nylon rope and tied in the very same, very distinctive way, like certain knot. You know, some people are very, very talented in these like different knots that you can use and it was a very unusual knot. So it was a means of them being able to identify her killer in the future as being able to tie this distinctive knot and suspicions were all but confirmed that they had a serial killer on their hands. Investigators decided to interview a bunch of local women in hopes of them having maybe some strange encounters with some men, potentially if there had been any failed abductions maybe at the hands of this man. Some female students at Oregon State University had actually reported receiving some strange phone calls from an unknown man. He had introduced himself to the women as a Vietnam veteran looking for someone to go on a date with him. One of the students decided to take him up on his offer for a date and they'd met up and she had described him as being a heavy set man with light hair and a freckled face. 
She'd recalled the man bringing up the conversation topic of the bodies that had been found in the nearby river and had made an attempt to joke about how it was possible for him to take her away and strangle her if he wanted to, which is obviously a very strange conversation topic to, to have with someone on a first date. She'd survived the date with no issues whatsoever and the police had told her to contact them if he ever tried to call her again, simply because they were trying to explore any potential avenue they could. And surely enough, a few days later, the same man rang up the same young woman and asked to meet up with her. This man had in fact turned out to be Jerry Brudos. Police were informed of the meeting that this woman had set up with him and rather than turn up herself, the police had met him in her place. They arrested him and interrogated him just as a potential suspect. They'd brought in a woman who Brudos had previously attempted but failed to abduct and she identified him as being the man who had attacked her. And because of this, they were able to gain a search warrant to enter his home. And this is where they found all of the evidence that he had collected at some point during his attacks, including the photographs that he had taken of each of the victim's remains. Brudos admitted to four murders, as well as admitting to each of his failed and attempted abductions and attacks. And he continued to go into vivid detail about each of his crimes and attacks, so much so that a lot of the interviews and um, sources and recordings and things all say that he was kind of a chatterbox, he wouldn't stop talking about each of his crimes. According to the claims he made, he actually told investigators that some of the breasts that he'd removed from the remains, he had actually turned into his very own personal paperweights. And if if you didn't think it already, this just solidifies the fact that he was a very sick and twisted individual. It was during his confessions that he explained fully how he chose to kill each of his victims. His method of choice was to tie a rope around their necks and hang them from a beam in his garage where he would strangle them himself. And as I'd mentioned, the photographs that were found in his possession had been taken of the woman after they died. What's even more condemning is that when they'd examined these photographs closer, in one of them depicting Jan Whitney's remains, they'd spotted a very small distant reflection of Brudos' face in a mirror in the room. And upon investigating him further, they just became more and more aware of his concerning history with attacking women. Ultimately, they were able to charge Brudos with the murders of Karen Sprinker and Linda Saley due to the fact that the bodies were found. Ultimately, they were able to charge Brudos with the murders of Karen Sprinker and Linda Saley despite his attempt to plead not guilty by insanity. He was examined and categorised as legally sane as he made it clear that he was fully aware of what he was doing, he showed no remorse, and if anything, he was almost boasting about the details of each of the crimes to any investigators that had tried to interview him. And Jerry Brudos pled guilty finally to the murders of Karen Sprinker, Linda Saley and Jan Whitney, but he couldn't be charged with the murder of Linda Slauson due to the fact that they were never able to recover her remains. As a result of the three murders, he he received three consecutive life sentences, although he had been eligible for parole every two years. Now, from what I can gather, this is due to the fact that he was tried under an old system that isn't really applied nowadays, so something that it really wouldn't happen. And nowadays, the eligibility for parole is based on the severity of crimes, and I think it's based on like the, um, the history of the perpetrator, whether they had a past of previous crimes. So nowadays, the length of parole eligibility is established by that, but he was eligible to apply for parole every two years during his prison sentence. According to many of the people and other prisoners inside the prison serving at the same time as Brudos, he was regarded as a well-behaved and model prisoner. And then in March of 2006, Jerry Brudos died aged 67 in Oregon State Penitentiary of natural causes. And that is everything I'm going to discuss regarding Jerry Brudos's crimes. So I hope you guys found this interesting let me know if you want me to cover more serial killer cases as i said at the start they do take a little bit more time to research because there's just so much information but if you are interested in them especially if they are maybe some of the lesser known serial killers then please let me know down below as well as if you have any requests for like lesser known serial killers thank you guys so much for watching i hope you found this interesting and i will see you guys very soon for another video thanks for watching bye